Hi, my name is Angela Cozzi. I'm a sociologist, assistant professor of Romani studies at the CU. And today I'm going to talk about Romani feminisms, intersectionality, LGBTIQ activism. Um, of course, we can approach it from a various angle from, uh, and explain it from various perspectives, but I will focus on the theory, intersectionalities, as well as I would like to provide some kind of periodization of Romani movement. But before I'm going to start, um, I would like to say a few words about why the feminist perspectives is very important in Romani studies. So if you think about popular culture nowadays, but even in the past as well, uh, Roma always has been falsely constructed and vigorously recycled as an exotic dancer, musicians, welfare dependents, prostitutes and thieves and, and, and many others essentialize iconic figures of deviance, uh, which basically represented some kind of racialized otherness in, in European social and political discourse. And um, even um, until recently, uh, Roma has been depicted even in academic discourses as a homogeneous monocultural group where gender, class and other internal differences and other sociological factors doesn't really count. And uh, I would like to evoke uh, a, a scholar, Edward Said, who actually talked about why is it important to, to give a more nuanced and more sophisticated discourse, which really uh, reflect to the certain population. So I would like to quote Edward Said, why is it important to give an alternative canon? Um, quoting him, one of the major roles today for the intellectuals in the public sphere is to function as a kind of public memory, to recall what is forgotten or ignored, to connect and contextualize and to generalize from what appeared to be the truth. Let's say in the newspaper or on the television, the sun by the isolated story and connect them to the larger process, which might have produced the situation that we are talking about. I believe that um, for us, for me as a feminist scholar, it's very important to provide this kind of alternative canon, which, um, which recall the, 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 uh, what is ignored, ignored the gender dimension in the Romani activism. And, um, and still, before I'm going to start, I still would like to go back to some kind of myth which, uh, which has been very dominant in, uh, even amongst Roma as well, that the myth about Romani feminism. Some people think that all Romani feminists are lesbians who hate men. And, um, and I would like to debunk this kinds of myth because being feminist neither defines your sexual orientation nor encourages you to discriminate against male gender. So I, Feminist comes from different backgrounds, schools, political cultures to support equality, gender equality and racial equality as well. Um, which means that it's really served the interest of males as well. Um, as Bell Hooks put it, and the way as she described feminism is really a movement to end sexism. I would like to quote her the way as she defines, so basically by naming sexism as the problem, it went directly to the heart of the matter. Practically, it is a definition which implies that all sexist thinking and action is the problem, whether those who perpetuate it are female or male, child or adult. It is also broad enough to include an understanding of systemic institutionalized sexism. 
as a definition, it is open-ended. To understand feminism, it implies one has to necessarily understand sexism. So why I brought this definition? Because basically what Bell Hooks is talking about, that it's very important to understand the systemic nature of institutionalized sexism. But we know from her books and from uh, from her several articles, not just sexism, but racism is very important as well. So that's how we come to the point that basically Romani feminisms um, gains uh, lots of conceptual ideas and, and uh, got some political inspirations from black feminists, post-colonial feminists, and so on. And, and they were challenged in a similar way um, uh, the global sisterhood, a kind of universal feminism, which was very much propagated uh, by white feminists. And as we wrote in our edited volume, so universal or global sisterhoods has since the 1970s become a compelling paradigm by proclaiming essentialized identities of womanhood and shared gender oppression by patriarchy. So this unifying global feminist idea has been criticized by black women, women of color, and um, third world feminists, whom we call like feminists who are coming from a global south, who by doing so have challenged the social system that privileges middle class white Western women. So this critique has significantly shaped the conceptual language of Roman women feminism in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, intersectionality, Firstly, as a theoretical frame, uh, provided a kind of double critiques for us. So firstly, it challenged the concept of global sisterhood, uh, which did not account for class and racial inequalities. And secondly, it challenged the monofocal identity-based politics in the black movement and sidelined gender, class, and, and other um, sociological differences. So basically, intersectionality has been formulated in many other ways by many feminists, even earlier than Kimberly Crenshaw, who really named these complex oppressions and violence. It was um, articulated, for example, by the Combahee River Collections group of black feminists in, in 1977, or by Patricia Hill Collins, who called it as a matrix of oppression, or Barbara Smith, just to mention a few um, early feminists from the black women's movement. And the way as Kimberla Crenshaw defined um, this complex oppressions and violence, racism as experienced by people of color who are of a particular gender, male usually, tends to determine the parameters of anti-racist strategies, just as sexism as experienced by women who are of a particular race, why tends to grant the women's movement. So basically what we can see here that um, that there is a lack of intersectional understanding by the anti-racist movement as well as by the white feminist movement. And Crenshaw uses this concept of intersectionality to grasp the way in which the interactions of gender and race limit black women's access to American labor market and how a lack of understanding this intersection lead to the marginalization of black women and black women's experiences. And um, Crisho argues that the experience faced by women of color were not subsumed within the traditional boundaries of race or gender discrimination as these boundaries are currently understood. So it was a very monofocal and um, 
and and um, and basically focused on one concept. So the 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 feminist movement um, focused on gender, and anti-racist movement was focusing on on blackness and race. So. Um, in, uh, in this way, it's very important to distinguish the two kinds of intersectionalities what um, Kimberla Crenshaw is talking about. So the first one is the political intersectionality, and the second one is the structural intersectionality. And the political intersectionality, actually, um, the concept what which has been used many times by feminist in Europe. So political intersectionality is mainly a kind of agenda setting process. For example, an anti-racist agenda may not include the critique of systemic inequalities perpetuated by patriarchal policies. Similarly, feminist agenda may fail to address the systemic inequalities perpetuated by racism. So it's a very important concept to apply when we are analyzing and talking about the um, anti-racist black movements or even Romani movements in Europe, as well as the, the feminist movements. Um, Chris Shaw was talking about it in, U in a US context, but we are referring here uh, to the European uh, feminist context. So the structural inequality addresses the practices, policies, and strategies of a given culture or institution and the consequences of those institutionalized and structural violence based on individual experience and structural position. And I would like to highlight actually that this why structural intersectionality is important. It's, um, it's, it's provide us a theoretical lens and to understand the, the embedded institutionalized structural violence based on race and gender. So talking about Romani feminism, how it has been evolved or the genesis of the contemporary Romani feminism, and I would like to go back actually and to define it in a similar way as black fe feminists did in 1977 in the Combahee River Collection Statement. And, um, and, and as Angela Dan Davis was talking about that before looking at the recent development, you know, the, um, the Roma feminism or in the US, the black feminism, I think it's really important to affirm that we find our origins in a historical reality of Romani women's continuous life and death struggle for survival and liberation. And contemporary Romani feminism is, a, is its outgrowth of a countless generations of personal sacrifice, militancy, resistance, and work by our mothers and sisters. Uh, and sexism and racism basically determine always our relationship to the very respective economic and political system. So basically our racialized and sexualized uh, subject positions shaped and informed our political activism as well. And uh, I wrote um, an essay in the Roma archive, what you can check out on the website, which is about the buildings, blocks of the Romani women's movement in Europe, which gives you some kind of timelines, um, periodization of, of the Romani women's activism. I would like just um, highlight uh, a few important points because you can read that essay. Basically, yes, summarizing those um, and those short periods. So first of all, if you think about the, the, the how 
people write and narrated the whole Romani political um, activism, it was always narrated from a very heterosexual, masculine perspective with the role of being magnified and by the accomplishment of women and of people of differing sexualities becoming rather diminished or even invisible matter. So until recently, gender was an analytical tool to particularly examine the participation of Romani women in political activism and the Romani civil rights movement. I would like to remind you to the first, very first quote that I brought by Edward Said. So basically, it's really important to talk about those issues as well, which has been ignored in a social um, uh, and political discourse. So talk about gender, gender-based and, um, and race-based, which are intersected, as I was talking about, to talking about this kind of racialized and sexualized oppressions and violence is very important and um, and it provides us some kind of um, alternative narrative to understand the situation of Roma. So I I'm talking about the Romani women early activism. I'm referring back in this essay, what, what I wrote in the Roma archive, political activism in the 1920s and 30s, how Romani women has been, uh, had been, um, involved in establishing, uh, uh, an, organizations, and I'm talking about the Romani women's particular resistance during the Holocaust. And, and the second period, what I'm referring is basically between 45 and 89. I'm referring Maria Laszlo, who was one of the first Hungarian Romani women who actually uh, received the mandate from the Hungarian government to establish the Hungarian Gypsy Cultural Association. And I'm talking about Agnes Dorotzi, uh, whom we know, uh, who, who was one of the oppositional leaders in that time under state socialism and become an iconic figure in the fight for recognition of Roma. And also I'm talking about that why Maria Laszlo remained a Hungarian Romani leader Agnes Dorothy was able to transcend these national borders and, um, and she was able to build a transnational profile and the Roma Solidarity Network. And I'm also talking about as an early feminist, Nadezhda Demeter, a uh, Romani ethnographer, and talking about Katarina Taikon, Langhammer, a Swedish Romani activist, leader in the civil rights movement, writer and actor from a Calderash family who was advocating for the rights of Roma refugees in Sweden. And uh, the second period actually is uh, between 1989 and 2005. Um, and I'm referring back that even though the 1990s brought a new hope and um, really positive and optimistic perspectives for women's rights in general, um, women's equality and feminist ideas, particularly in the post-communist post countries, become the most contested and challenging issues. And these ideas, theories, and practices had already been developed in Western European countries in the early 1970s, but had not had any impact on Romani women activism until the early 1990s. And I'm talking about the 90s, the Hitanas movement in Spain, which is very important. And, and it made a huge impact on, on Central and Eastern European Romani women's activism. And the Hitanas actually distinguished themselves both from the male dominated Spanish Romani movement 
and from the Spanish women's movement, which sought to integrate them. On the one hand, they aim to uh, dismantling machoism and patriarchy, while on the other hand, they challenge the historically rooted gendered anti-Gypsism, which the Hitano community had uh, suffered for centuries. And I'm also talking about the, the uh, 90s, actually, uh, which is very important and significant from a Romani women's perspective because all kinds of parliamentary elections in the 90s uh, made visible Romani women in various countries. For example, in the 1990 elections in Czechoslovakia, there were several MEPs who identified as Roma, and including Anna Koptova, who was elected as a representative for the people against violence by the party. And, uh, and after the dissolution of Czechoslovakia, 1993, Monika Horatkova was elected to the Czech Chamber of Deputies by the Freedom Unions as one of the new generations of Romani political activists in 1998. And and, and also in Hungary, it was very important, the uh, parliamentary elections in 1990. Um, uh, after the first de um, democratic election held in Hungary, the Liberal Party, the Free Democratic Party, offered two Romani people the opportunity to be elected as members of the national parliament, one of them being Antonia Haga and the other was Aladar Horvat. And, and also in the 90s and early 2000s, several Romani women um, uh, were appointed to high positions in various governments, but I think it's very important to refer to that as well. For example, in Slovakia, Klara Orkovanova was an advisor uh, to the Slovak government from 1991 to 1993. And in 2001, she was appointed as a plenipotentiary for Roma issues. And in Hungary, Eva Hegesini Orsos became the first and only Romani president of the Office for Hungarian National and Ethnic Minorities between 1995 and 1998. And also, I would like to highlight Judith Berki from Hungary, who was appointed uh, Deputy State Secretary for Roma Integration at the Hungarian government between 2002 and 2004. So, meanwhile, um, I, I can't talk about all the initiatives at the international level, but I would like to highlight two very significant. So one of that is the Romani Women's Initiative, um, which was um, funded and supported by the Open Society Foundation and operated from 1999 to 2006. And um, they organized the very first international conference of Romani women in Budapest in cooperation with the Roma participation program at Open Society Foundation, which was led in that time by Rutko Kavczynski. And um, following the conference, they established um, a fellowship for Romani women, and Liliana Kovacheva from Bulgaria was one of the first fellow who created a database about Romani women who are who, who, who were working in various NGOs, and and um, and later on, actually, Nicoletta Bitu, Asbia Memedova and Issa Aminova in 1999, they established the Romani Women's Initiative um, with the support of Deborah Schultz, feminist historian and funding director of the OSF Women's Program. And, uh, and I would like to quote Deborah Schultz um, the way as she described their collaboration in creating these Romani Women's Initiatives were the following. 
as an unprecedented collaborative experiment in intersectional feminist practice that operated at local, national, and transnational level. And that's absolutely true that they were very much visible, not just at the local and national level, but also at the, at the international level. And um, the second very important uh, Romani Women's Network uh, was called International Romani Women's Network, um, which was established in 2003 by the assistance of the Council of Europe. And, um, and, and that was actually uh, a bit different from the, from the Irving, from the Romani Women's Initiative. And it was a kind of more traditional leadership, what they represented, and included Agnes Daluzzi, Letizia Mark, Miranda Volus Rantra, and, um, and the first, um, um, actually president was a Soraya Post, um, who later on, uh, become the, the, the member of the European Parliament. And, uh, and also I think it's very important to mention from this time that Leticia Mark and Annika Vince with a non-Romani feminist and allies, they, 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 they produced a very important and trailblazer Romani feminist journal in 2009. It was called the uh, Nevisari Kala, which is very important. So, um, continue, uh, with the, um, with these very important achievements, what Romani women did, the European Parliament actually was another institution where, interestingly, Romani women um, were elected. And the first MEP was Livia Yaroka, who is still there in the European Parliament. And she was elected by the right-wing populist party in 2004. And the second Romani MEP was Victoria Mohaci, uh, who replaced another Hungarian MEP. And later on, from 2014 till 2019, Soraya Post was also a member of the European Parliament from Sweden and, and, and who was supported by the Feminist Initiative. Um, which is a part of the progressive allies of socialists and democrats in Sweden. Also, I would like to highlight one important uh, document which was produced by the European Parliament amongst the many initiatives and motions. So in, in, in June 2006, the European Parliament um, issued its first historic resolution on the situation of, of Romani women in the Euro EU member states. And, and it was really important because basically the report was based on the research um, uh, which was produced by Romani women scholars and activists and policy experts. So Romani women's voice and uh, knowledge has uh, had been presented in this report. And um, of course, I can go on and, and I can list many other, you know, really important Romani feminists, particularly at the transnational level, just to mention few. Um, Rita Izak Nadiae, who was actually appointed in 2011 as the independent expert on, on minority issues um, by the Human Rights uh, Council in Hungary. So she's still working in the UN and um, very important um, spokesperson uh, for Romani feminism. And the second one, Miriam Karoy, who became an ODIR OSCE senior advisor on Roma and Sinti issues from 2013 to 2017. And 
Miranda Volusantra, actually, who's been the first female president of the European Roma and Travelers Forum. And, and these are really important uh, achievements. So, as a last point, I just would like to mention that how Romani women's movement started to be as a queer or become queer or the queering of Romani movement, how it has had happened. So I would say that when Vera Kurtic published her book on the Roma lesbian existence, Jubilee in 2013, that was a really, really important um, um, theme actually to talk about um, lesbian ex existence in the Romani feminist movement. And also, I think it was a, a, another episode from 2015, the very first international Roma LGBTQI conference, which took place as a part of the Prague Pride Festival in 2015, where many uh, activists, queer Roma, LGBTIQ Roma activists came together and discussed those issues um, which, um, which had been and had been sidelined by the Romani movements as well as by Romani feminists. Um, I would finish here because um, I will have several outspoken, eloquent um, panelists uh, who are much more knowledgeable on LGBTIQ, Roma and queer intersectionalities than I am. And please stay with us. We're going to continue with a very interesting panel discussion. Bye.